what have been the most important developments in a human development? Now, first question, wow, since when do we measure the human development? When do we start? Well, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, the primitive forms of Homo sapiens evolved 300,000 years before Common Age. And modern Homo sapiens, uh, Cro-Magnon men, only 40,000 years, 40, years before Common Age. Um, they were foragers, our ancestors were foragers, they were, they were collecting fruits and plants, hunting animals. And uh, maybe we should start measuring time with that, but many anthropologists will disagree with that. They say, no, 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 there's many more important things. Actually, it's a farming. You see, the dog may have been domesticated 14,000 years before Common Age, but horse was domesticated only 8,000 years before Common Age. We then learned how to keep uh, horses in corrals, uh, ox was hinged to a, a plow maybe 6,000 years before Common Age, which obviously led to agriculture and farming. So our ancestors didn't have to follow uh, the, the animals and, 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 and hunting grounds and find the food for themselves, but they can actually produce a food for themselves. Which then meant that there were first settlements, uh, these first settlements led to formations of villages and cities, accumulation of wealth. And with accumulation of wealth, there were other people who said, oh, you know, I don't want to work in a field, I'd rather plunder, I'd rather take hold of that wealth, which led to wars and invasions and big empires. And empires were also a very transformative moment in, uh, in human development. Ottoman Empire, Mongol Empire, Arab Empire, Roman Empire. And they were very, very uh, transformational in the sense that they were uh, un uniting customs, trade, they brought people together. They, uh, after all, they had a common empire. So it must be that wars, or maybe the plants, or maybe farming, had something to do with human development. Or, if it were not for fighting men, there must be a great ideas. Uh, three big thinkers, Buddha, uh, Confucius and Socrates lived approximately at the same time, some five, six uh, centuries before Common Age. Philosopher Karl Junker says, oh, this is Axial Age. This is the time of awakening of our species. We became aware of who we are. Buddha, of course, founded one of the major religions and other religions as well, as hundreds of millions of people will argue, are very, very important in the history of mankind. The Christianity, Islam, Judaism uh, are very, very important. So they must have been, as many people will passionately claim, very important for human development. Uh, religion is spread through a spoken, but also through a written word. So it must be that writing has something to do with very important part of human development. First. Uh, records come from Mesopotamia, they did not have numbers, uh, they didn't have, they, although there was some support to numbering system to facilitate ex ex exchange over goods, but the simple concept like number of zero was not there for another 4,000 years when today's modern Arabic counting system that we use almost universally across the world uh, was invented. Historian Ian Morris was very interested to study, he said, looking at these oceans of facts is very, very hard. So he tried to reduce this to some sort of quantifiable scale. And he looked at the four things. The one is energy capture. And he went to really painstaking detailed study. And he said, well, um, energy capture must be important because this is how much energy we can uh, collect for food, for transport, etc., etc." So that's one factor. The other factor is complexity of organization, so, so he took the largest city uh, as, as a proxy of that. Uh, war making capabilities, of course, uh, size of troops and weapons, etc., etc. And finally, information, how do we exchange information, how we process it, etc., etc. So he sort of added all these things together, and of course he simplifies things, and, and, and there are disadvantages in doing this, but there is also some advantages. And his facts are, his findings are astonishing. 
What is astonishing, he plots here a, uh, uh, the social development index on your left hand side and population of, of, of people on, on planet Earth on the right hand side, and the two lines are almost identical. Uh, what is also very astonishing is that it seems like human progress was very boring, was very uh, flat. We progressed very, very slowly. But something happened in mid 18th century. And what is it that happened in mid 18th century is a machine. And that's not one machine, but series of developments around uh, steam engine and James Watt's invention. And clearly that, although this is not a one single moment, there are also a number of events that unfolded industrial revolution, advantages in metallurgy, in mechanical engineering, in chemistry, that rapidly accelerated development. Engines and technology advanced, suddenly there are these new technologies that could move and uh, help us, uh, our species, Homo sapiens, to do something about this. So this age of the first machine really helped us by managing a physical power, extending our muscle power and muscle power of animals around us so that we could generate and dispose uh, and use mechanical power for any useful purpose. We can move faster, we can lift heavy things, etc., etc., which was also not always without, uh, without, rec without resistance. And what happened to our good, good old friend horse? Um, there was 28 million horses, approximately 28 million horses, living in North America at the end of 19th century. Today there are only 2 million the horses have been replaced by tractors and other machinery in agriculture and, 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 and you know, you can imagine. Now, we are now surrounded by some other kinds of machines. And these machines are, for all practical purposes, much better than we are. And we have these machines all around us. So this extension or help to our mental power is really a very important moment. It, you know, if, if the physical power uh, supported by the first machine age, you can imagine what the second machine age could do for us. And this all has to do with increasing uh, uh, power in computing. There's this famous uh, Moore's law that says that every year uh, computing ability essentially doubles, more or less, uh, which means that computers, computers today are roughly 100 billion times faster than computers that were used maybe 40 years ago. So next year they will double, they, were, they will be 200 billion times faster, and year after it will be 400 billion. So something which is already great moves ever faster and faster. The other thing is this, that everything is connected, this Internet of Things notion. We have appliances at home, cameras and whatever. You can turn on your aircon remotely, you can collect the data remotely. This, this confluence of collecting data and processing all this information creates a very interesting dynamics as we speak. So, what about the water? This small island in which we live, around 720 square kilometers with almost 6 million people, we have both too little and too much water. We are not water self-sufficient, so we have to import 40% of water from the province of Johor in Malaysia. And at the same time, as we all know, it, when it rains, it rains cats and dogs, and it gets very, very wet. Uh, so it's sort of very bizarre. We are the 10th most water-stressed country on planet Earth, and yet at the same time, we sometimes experience having too much water. This is what happened in January 8 in Bedok, Singapore. This is taken by a colleague of mine going to work in a bus, and off she goes. Uh, there is a bit of a heavy rain. And that heavy rain, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a lovely video, and it shows that this happens in these highly developed, very sophisticated, smart cities as, as ourselves. So how, how can this possibly happen? Well, it, it's hard. The rainfall in tropics is very, very difficult. This is what we call a microburst, or convective storm. When it rains, it rains through these convective cells, and as we all experience here in Singapore, you can walk on one side of the road and it's perfectly dry, and on the other side of the road it could be 
raiding cats and dogs. So um, it's highly, it's highly uh, uh, unevenly distributed. It's very difficult to predict. So what can be done about this? Um, a group with which I'm associated uh, has developed in collaboration with PUB here in Singapore and deployed a system of rainfall radars. This is a very special X-band radar, it's a technical term, but what makes these radars very, very special is that they can provide information at a size of 100 by 100 meters, the size of a football pitch. And what is even better, we can provide this, generate a new rainfall forecast every two minutes. So every two minutes you'll get an updated rainfall forecast for the next six, seven hours, and I can tell you whether this pitch will remain dry or wet and very accurately. So this is good. So we can move because flooding in cities is very localized phenomenon. You really know what, ha what happens at, at the level of the street. But radar, even though fantastic, it sees, it senses the rain in the sky a few thousand meters above the ground. So we have to see what happens on the ground. And what happens on the ground, well we can have measuring devices, but we've got this very interesting approach that we could use video signals and I would not expect you to go outside and put your phone, smartphone and take pictures of falling rain, but our city, and like any other modern city, has tens of thousands of CCTV cameras. So we are converting CCTV feeds into very localized rateful information. The next time you get into MRT station, look around how many cameras are there, and these are all possibly rainfall meters. How does this work? So this is a rainfall video taken off my, just in front of my office at NUS. So what you need to do, you first need to highlight the raindrops. And of course, the longer the rainfall streak, uh, the faster the raindrop moves. So it's a bit larger than the others. Uh, then what you need to do, you need to subtract the background simply because people that install security cameras do not like you to see what they're looking at. Uh, so this is perfectly anonymized. And then you use uh, uh, some computing te techniques to find out how far away are these rain streaks uh, and how large are they. And if you add them all together, this is what you end up with. You have a video signal, two cameras at the top, and below you have instantaneous rainfall rate. Uh, and you can see as the rainfall increases, uh, the camera detects this. Uh, information and when it stops, uh, it accurately predicts. So this is this is great. We call this the rain. Obviously, is just a, a one of the environmental par parameters: uh, air quality, uh, temperature, atmospheric pressure. You name it. Many many factors can be can be uh, processed. Particularly now that, that we have all these variable devices, smart watches, smartphones that collect the data, and we can process them. We call this opportunistic sensing. You see, the cameras are not installed to measure rainfall. The cameras are there to do something else, and we are processing this to arrive at a different information, information that could bring more value from a water management perspective. So, is there a shift in authority here? Because, you know, a camera can now detect and calculate rainfall intensity. That is sort of sort of scary thought because these machines are now able to do the things that once we were supposed to be. So for, sort of for the four billion years, the life on planet Earth evolved using principles of natural selection, but now we are moving to this age of intelligent design and what was previously done exclusively by humans is increasingly now done by AI. Clearly, there is a. Are we going the way of the horse? We have these machines around us that are doing so many things better than we do. And this is uh, Vasily Leontiev. He's a, a Russian, uh, North American uh, Nobel Prize winner economist. And he asked this you know, are we going the way of the horse? Uh, 28 million, 2 million? Is, are we, is the same stuff going to happen to us? Well, I am not that pessimistic. I don't think we are going the way of the horse, because I believe in this stage of extended intelligence that uh, while you can design machine to be better than human in any particular aspect, 
Uh, you can have a machine that is much faster than a human, and it can lift heavier stuff or compute faster than a human. A human with a good machine cannot be outperformed by a uh, machine alone. So this whole notion of artificial intelligence of that we find very exciting and very, very useful actually should be considered perhaps by a notion of extended intelligence. How do we use these intelligent designs to help us do our job better? Among the other things, also water management. Thank you.